This week, we are continuing the second part of Dr. Matthew Sleeth's talk from our Faith Meets Mental Health Summit this past May. If you haven't already, be sure to listen to the previous episode to catch up on Dr. Sleeth's talk so far. And so, uh, Scripture explains who our enemy is, what's going on, and when I talk to young people, and I, I am so fortunate that my age, I get to talk to college auditoriums over and over again. I tell them one thing. If you leave here and the only thing that you remember is this one thing, is that if you ever hear a voice telling you that you would be better off the world without the world or the world would be better off without you, that is the voice of your enemy. That is the voice of Satan. Uh, I get to talk to secular audiences and groups of physicians and psychiatrists and that sort of thing who do not necessarily raise, uh, who do not necessarily share my worldview and my faith. And when I start talking about Jesus throwing out demons, which was brought up earlier, man, you can see the hair go up on the back of their neck. They're like, ooh, one of these crazy pie in the sky kind of guys until I remind them to remember how many suicide notes have the following phrase in it, I can no longer deal with the demons. It's almost half of the suicide letters. There are many studies on suicide letters, and it's a great number. Doc, you ever seen that? Oh, you guys ever seen that? Yeah. I can no longer deal with the demons. Um, and so our scripture has quite a bit about this. And as was pointed out earlier, you stole my, uh, my, my uh, Bible references there, but you didn't steal them, you pointed them out. Many people in scripture deal with despair, despair that makes them want to take their own life. Um, Moses did, Elijah did, uh, Jonah did, David did, Paul the Apostle did. Um, and yet, if you study what happens when they call out to God with that despair, God treats that despair in many different ways. In, in the case of Elijah, um, Elijah is burned out. And so he relieves Elijah of his, his tasks, his jobs. He rests him, he feeds them. Um, you know that acronym HALT, hungry, angry, lonely, tired? <laughs> he addresses all those things. In the case of Jonah, Joan needs a correction of his bad thinking. Um, and, and so there, uh, there is not only uh, su suicide, not only people thinking about it in the Bible, but God addressing those things. And, and, um, and so our scripture is just filled um, with this human condition um, and, and, we, and it's natural to put our faith together with mental health. Um, and so uh, the, <clears throat> the one thing I want to tackle before I go forward and that I get asked about over and over again, particularly in colleges, is, is suicide the unforgivable sin? Who has heard that float around somewhere? Yeah. And I think that we ought to be able to address that. Uh, first of all, is suicide a sin? And the Bible's quite clear about that. The answer is yes. Thou shall not kill. Uh, Exodus 20. It tells us not to kill. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians says um, that our body is the temple of the Lord. And whoever destroys that temple, God will destroy. We know that suicide is a sin. But my understanding of the Bible is that that's why Jesus came, to deal with sin, and that there's nothing, um, uh, no sin that his death on the cross will not cover, okay? And I think that we, we, um, we, can, we, we have a proof text really for this. I'm gonna go to Romans 8, just the last verse. This is Paul's great treatise on theology. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us 
from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want an amen on that. Okay. Um, I believe um, that if we are in Christ Jesus and someone takes their own life, um, that, 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 that sin is covered by Christ's atoning death on the cross. That's my the theology on this. However, if someone's not in Christ, it doesn't matter how they die. They, they don't want to be in heaven or they don't know about it or whatever. So you have to be in Christ for that. And I think that we must tell the truth no matter how hard it is to say. And the, the hardest is, any pastors in the room had to do a suicide a funeral for a non-believer? I cannot tell you that there's a harder thing. I've done them. And, and so I get asked the question, well, how do we offer solace or, or whatever to uh, a family that's lost somebody that wasn't a believer? I believe that the safe position biblically to be in here is to plead for mercy. You can get right up in God's face. <laughs> Go read Abraham pleading for Sodom when you plead for mercy for someone else. By the way, he does some pretty funny math as he's coming down in that, that uh, thing there. And so if you need to have a, a service for that person, just prayers for God's mercy, I think is, is the way to go and not some platitude that isn't biblical. Uh, because a lack of truth, I think, is partly contributing to the phenomenon of of suicide that we're seeing now. So, uh, let's see, what has the church done? I'm afraid that your church here is a little bit unique. I, I think that the church has been sitting this one out for a while. Uh, and, and that uh, the church, although many, many uh, in the church, many pastors and leaders know that perhaps suicide is wrong. They, they have that biblically. They have not been trained on that in seminary. I was, uh, the last seminary I was at, a seminary professor, my, my mouth kind of dropped open, the humility of this person. He said, I would be hard pressed to articulate a theology of suicide. And I don't think it's the church's fault. I don't want to blame them here in a way. Um, I think they knew what was wrong. And by the way, if you back up 200 years ago, in Western society, the church was essentially the only institution that was really addressing suicide. And they did a better job than we do with a trillion dollar healthcare system. Their numbers were better than ours. Think they didn't have any medicines, but they did a better job. And so I'm all for medicines. Remember the joke, shoot them, they're all dead. I, whatever works, <laughs> I'm for. But you don't drop the other half that really works, which is faith. You, you put them together. You see that King Asa, obscure king in, in, uh, in the Old Testament, he had problems with his feet. He went to the physicians only. The point was he didn't also pray. We need everything that works <laughs> here. We need our faith. We need medicines. We need counseling, um, et cetera. And so I, I'm just delighted that, that this church and some others are finally digging into this. We've got something that nobody else has. We have answers of where suicide came from and what's really going on. Jesus puts it succinctly in John 10.10. 10. The thief, Satan, comes to kill and destroy and steal. I came that you would have life and have it more abundantly. And Jesus is all about hospitals and healthcare. Okay, so um, uh, I got a text message this morning and I gotta think this is providential. Do you mind if I share my text message with you? Okay. I got this at 6.26 a.m. from a number and no name attached. Two years ago today, you guys put hands on me and prayed, and I was different when I got up. 
thanks for saving my life. And I wrote, this is wonderful news, but who is this? <laughs> thanks. <laughs> and he says uh, his name, and he says, it was a podcast you did with uh, two other guys. Oh, wonderful. Thank you for the update. Now he says, I'm helping other parents now that have lost their children at church. I did, uh, it wasn't a podcast, it was a radio show, uh, Solid Steps Radio in Louisville uh, with the two hosts. And they took me to lunch beforehand and uh, a couple of great guys. And they said, do you mind if we have a guy sit in the studio with us while we do uh, the show? I said, no. And they said, well, great, because he might be a little scary. <laughs> He um, is uh, not only suicidal, we think he's a little homicidal. Uh, he has lost uh, two of his sons to suicide, and one of them was abused by somebody, and he has a gun, and he wants, he's thinking about killing that person and then himself. So would you mind if he sat in the studio? Oh yeah, sure. So this guy sat in the studio and I, we talked about suicide just like I'm talking to you now. And, um, and at the end of the show, I said, can we pray for you? And we did, we put our hands on him and we prayed for him. Uh, two weeks later, he was baptized. He's now in counseling. It's not just prayer. Uh, I don't know if he's on any medicines or anything, but I gotta tell you, this was a scary guy. You will save lives by caring. And, and it was mentioned this mor morning that it's our moral duty to be involved in this. Let me read one other piece of scripture about that moral duty, if I can find it. Um, it's a proverb. And it's a proverb that encourages us uh, to be our brother and sister's keeper. This is Proverb 24, 11, and it's the NIV version I'll read to you. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards the slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? And does not he who guards your life know it? And will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? There is in that an implied warning that we are our brothers and sisters keeper, that we are responsible uh, for our neighbors, and, and, um, but there's also an implied blessing that God sees when you go out of your comfort zone, when you ask somebody, how are you doing? When you don't just take the platitude of it's okay. Um, and, and, and when you help pave the way for people to be sent to that doctor or that therapist, um, that God will bless you for it. And so my, my hope here is that God will bless everyone in this room because you cared enough to be here today, because you care whether your brothers and sisters um, are listening to these voices that tell them that they would be better off if they weren't alive. I'm gonna stop and do Q&A. My favorite thing to do is question and answer. I am so happy that at this stage of life, I actually have churches now that have asked me to come and they cancel all the music and everything and I'm allowed to do a couple of hours of Q&A. I don't have a couple of hours. I tell people you can ask anything you want to stump the chump as long as it's nice. I don't do snarky. Um, uh, but uh, if you want, just ask from, I, un unlike these um, people that you've heard from earlier, uh, I, I am not in clinical medicine now, and I'm kind of doing this from the 30,000 foot level, but that has a unique view too. Uh, I think the next uh, event that I do like this is in Wyoming, which has the highest uh, suicide rate of any state, and, and, uh, and the same, the public health commissioner will be there and everything. And so I get to see this on a little bit bigger level, um, but it's not, it's not the same as clinically having somebody on the couch treating them and everything. So I'll defer from some of those questions.
All right, I can tell you where babies come from. <laughs> I'm a doctor. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Wanda Spillers, and I've enjoyed everything that you said this morning. Thank you. I have a medical question for you. How can we get more funds to take care of the mentally ill? Yeah, um, that's actually more than a medical question. <laughs> that's almost a political question. I, I think that, that what we're doing right here is part of the answer to that. I think that we have to move this out of the, just the therapist's office, just the doctor's office, and, and move it into here. Think about this. If somebody comes into the average church, and I, my wife stopped counting after I'd preached in a thousand churches. I've preached in a lot of churches. Um, and so I think I know a little bit about them. And if somebody came in and, Wanda, if you, you had uh, a, a new case of cancer, I'm, I'm betting at most churches that you would tell people that if the church was the appropriate size, it would be announced from the pulpit, that people would ask for prayers, um, that there might be meals brought to your house. Um, and uh, when somebody gets cancer, it's a knee jerk of mine to send them a check. Why? Because health insurance never covers all the costs. And so at a good church, people are gonna help you financially in every way. There is nothing wrong with that approach. I think it's the absolute right approach to how you would hands, handle a new case of cancer in a church. Does that sound like your church? What, that, what, what would happen? I think so, probably. Cont, uh, contrast that with if somebody has a, 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 a new case of depression, would they feel comfortable saying something? Are, are people gonna arrange meals? And by the way, for those who are dealing with mental illness, it's not just the person, it's their family. Often the family needs respite and, and support and everything. And meals and rides and that sort of thing can be invaluable um, if, if somebody's really struggling with mental illness. And so I think one of the things we have to do is get it right in the church. Jesus made no distinction between mental and physical illness, with one exception, he actually went out of his way to get to the people with mental illness. He went out of his way to get to the demoniac at the Gerasenes. By the way, it's another thing. When, when Jesus encounters that demoniac at Gerasenes, uh, the person with legions uh, in him, and he takes them and he throws them into the pigs, the pigs go and do the one thing animals never do. What did they do? They went and, went and committed suicide. So I think the answer, Wanda, is that what's happening right here and that we have to be able to talk about it from the pulpit. We have to be able to talk about it from Scripture. If you don't think Scripture deals with depression, go read Psalm 88. It's where Simon and Garfunkel literally got Hello Darkness, my old friend, from. Um, and, and so God is aware that we struggle with this. Jesus was sorrowful unto death. Um, and, and so we need to go to the source of life here and medicines and therapy. <laughs> okay, good question. Uh, my name is Christy. Thank you for your talk today. I'm over here. Where are you? Over here. Wave your hand. Right here. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, as we're, you know, I, I think about my own household and there's not a member of it who has not been deeply impacted by the suicide of another. Um, but I notice it more with our youth these days. Um, my nieces, my sons, eighth grade, go into school because a classmate um, experienced death by suicide. And so what I wonder is in a proactive approach to having open conversations with our youth, but also a responsive versus reactive approach how are we talking to these kids? So you point out an interesting thing. If you looked at the, um, the demographics of suicide over the last 50 years, uh, the, the, the number one person that's gonna take their own life is a, 
is a male in their 60s and older who is widowed. Uh, and that, that group just um, it has very lethal means and they kill themselves. Um, and that has been uh, the, the largest cohort of, of suicides uh, traditionally in the United States. But that has really changed. And we are seeing more and more young people, as you pointed out. In my um, city, Lexington, Kentucky, in a month's time, we had a 9, 10, 11, 12, and a 13-year-old all take their own lives. Um, and uh, the, the latest from the CDC, which came out a couple weeks before I went to Africa, uh, was about young women. I think it was 30 to 13, and don't quote me on that. But something like a third of those women in the United States wake up now every day struggling with whether or not to take their own lives. So we're, we're really seeing something that hasn't been um, witnessed before. I, 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 I do not think um, that I can beat around the bush. I think we're seeing the evidence of subtracting God from the equation. And where do we put God back in? This, this, this is where it is. It isn't that we subtract medicine or science or anything like that. Um, but uh, I think that we have to explain to those young people the importance of this. I think we have to be willing. Uh, one of the things that I, 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 last college I was at was Toccoa Falls College in Georgia. And it's a college of about 2,000 students. I did two chapels, a Tuesday and a Wednesday. After the Tuesday chapel, um, well, they'd asked me to come and talk about suicide. And I said, I have 30 minutes, I can't do it. I can't reverse you being through solitary confinement for years, uh, you know, everything that's going, I can't reverse it in 30 minutes. But I will start, and then whoever wants to go to class, go to class, and um, whoever wants to stay, I'll answer questions for as long as you want me to. I answered questions for over three hours with hundreds of students there. Uh, I think that, um, so my experience with young folks um, has been to do question and answer so that I am not answering questions they're not at asking. <laughs> Instead, I am answering the questions that they are asking. And, um, I was uh, asked to Woodford County Public High School. It's just a, it's a Woodford Reserve, Bourbon, Kentucky. Okay, anyways, that's where I'm from. And, and they have a fellowship of student athletes. They're allowed, they have a half an hour session before school begins. And a 16 year old asked me to come. And uh, he said, oh, we have about 20 students. Would you mind bringing books to give away for 20 students? I said, no. Um, I came and I brought a whole case. Uh, there were uh, almost 100 kids in the room. They would have stayed for hours. And so I think we need to make the space for them. I think we need to not give just lectures, but, but allow them to ask questions. They're dealing with stuff that I didn't, it was just sex, drugs, and rock and roll when I was a kid. That, um, it's gotten way more complicated. But uh, I think that we, 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 we need to have open discussions about this. Um, I, I just see that Gen Z in particular will stay for hours if I talk to them. Uh, and so you just make a space for them, that's all. You answer questions honestly, uh, and, and don't be ashamed of your faith. Um, I'm not, uh, and so good question, but the demographics are changing. We're definitely seeing young people um, uh, more and more thinking this is an option, if you will. So, yes, sir. Yeah, um, the question is about military and veteran uh, suicide. Um, this is, you know, it's, it, it's a huge number of not only veterans, but first responders. There's a ministry that I'm involved with called Reboot Recovery. And um, 
they bring the faith side into this. Their numbers are so good that the Department of Defense kind of has to allow them access to the VA systems and everything. I think we've got to bring faith back into this. Um, and, uh, you, you know, they have to, it, it, I can't just answer that in a moment because there's this whole moral injury, um, you know, phenomenon that goes on. Um, but, but these folks are, are, are really hurting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go here from problem to solution for a minute, though. I'm going to make a plug. Am I allowed to make a plug to come here Sunday? I'm going to talk about Sabbath. I want you to consider this. Western society for the last 2,000 years has stopped one day out of the week. This happened all through the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, the Reformation, everything. It's the way we've done business on this planet in Western society for 2,000 years. It came to a stop about 50 years ago. And um, I would doubt that there are many mental health counselors who get people and they're hearing all this t problem and they say, tell me about your Sabbath. And yet that was 14% of all of people's lives that they were not going and doing and getting and spending and they came to arrest. And if you look at books like The Blue Zone, which chronicles where people on the planet live the longest, the thing that they all have in common, as in a hundred years or more, is they stop one day out of the week. This is the way God designed this system. And so when you subtract God from the equation, bad stuff happens. Uh, our organization, Blessed Earth, did a study on 2,000 pastors in the state of North Carolina. It's a five-year study uh, funded by the Duke Endowment. There's like millions of dollars in st st uh, statisticians and psychologists and everything. Guess what happens when pastors keep the Sabbath? Their mental health improves. Guess what happens when people keep the Sabbath? their mental health improves. That's what Sunday sermons are about. And so where is that gonna come from? It's the VA isn't gonna say, let's take Sabbath. Uh, the National Institute of Mental Health isn't gonna say, gee, we think everybody shut it down one day out of the week. It's only the Bible, it's only our faith that can say that. So I think that Sabbath is one of those special sauces and I'll really get into it on Sunday. Um, I, I wrote that book 24-6 10 years ago. You couldn't even give it away. And it's become the best-selling book in the last 10 years on, on Sabbath. Um, and, and it gets easier and easier and easier to talk about it because our lives are getting crazier and crazier. And these young people, they live connected. And screenless Sundays are saving their lives. And so um, just because Sabbath ain't sexy, <laughs> doesn't mean it won't save your life. Um, by the way, my, my bottom line, I'll get into this on Sunday, but my bottom line theology on Sabbath is Sabbath keeping is not a condition of getting into heaven. It's just a condition that heaven is in if you get there. And uh, it, it has been the most uh, inspiring, uh, life-giving practice that I've had in my family and we started when we became Christians 20 years ago. On Sunday, I'll tell a little bit more of the story of that. So, so there's things like Sabbath and prayer and forgiveness, a lot of things that were mentioned that cannot necessarily be mentioned in a secular setting um, that we have at our disposal. We don't just have a hammer in our toolbox so the whole world looks like a nail. We've got a glorious, balanced uh, approach that we can have to, to mental illness and to young people in particular. Last question. You, if it's a good question, you win the car. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess since you've talked about a lot of, what creative ministries have you seen that have done a good job in all your travels and, and so forth. What, you talked about the veteran one, what other ones? You know, I've, I've got to say that the people I've dealt with from this conference have been about as cool as any I've dealt with. <laughs> and, and um, you know, 
give them gift cards to restaurants, fill their cars up with gas. Um, no, I'm, I mean, really encourage these people. When you have something right started here, you have something I will reference as I go out and talk. I've heard more good stuff from up here on the stage this morning than lots of other places I've been. And, um, and, and I'm just kind of, you know, stunned with the, not only the truth, but also the love um, that I have felt from the group that's done this. So um, if you don't mind, can I, I close in prayer? Heavenly Father, I ask you to pour out your blessings on the men and women here who care enough to come and talk about this, who care just like you did to go and seek out um, those that were struggling. Um, I ask that you bless everyone as they go out of here um, and that if anyone here is struggling uh, with these uh, demons of despair and anxiety and depression, um, that you get them whatever they need, um, the friendship, the content, the connection, uh, to, to live in peace and to triumph and um, whew, uh, to go and help others, just like this man that uh, texted me this morning. Um, please bless uh, Kim and everyone else who has worked on this uh, beyond measure. I ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and give us a review wherever you get your podcast. And remember, you can view these episodes on our YouTube channel as well as youtube.com slash Church.